this uh, book. We call it a book. It's more of a letter written to a young pastor named Timothy from Paul. Paul starts off in chapter 4, verse 3. He says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itchy or itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And then jump over to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. You say, I just got to Timothy. I don't I know. Try to jump over with me to Matthew, though. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 13, Jesus says this, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. You say, what is that word life? That is the, that is the Greek word zoe there. So what he's talking of is eternal life. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to eternal life and those who find it are are few. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, as we come together as a church community, Lord, be it it physically here or or online gathering or listening to a podcast or whether it's now or whether it's years from now, God, I, I ask that your spirit would move and work. God, we need you. This is your house. We are your people. Jesus is our Messiah, our Savior, our King. We make much of him. We make much of the gospel. We make much of the the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, as we read your word, which is truth, which is absolute truth, Father, I ask that we would meet you there. That you would meet us there. Father, that we would not leave this place the same way we entered in, that we would be challenged to our core because every time your word teaches us, every time your word is spoken, it never returns void, but it's always moving and shaping us. Illuminate your scripture to us today, Father. We need to hear from you. We need to hear from you. We pray all these things and ask all these things in Jesus' name. And we all said... Amen. Well, good morning, church. How are we today? We doing, you doing well? Yes? You're looking good? Uh, hey, let's welcome our, our friends, our family who are online. Can we all welcome them this morning? Got a lot of people joining in online, watching us today. As always, we're glad that you're here. Make sure to drop us a comment. Let us know where you're watching from today. We always love to have you join us, your family with us. Um, so today you might be asking the question, what, what are we doing in the book of Matthew? What are we doing in the book of Timothy? I thought we were in the book of John. We are. We are. Just chill. Just back up a little, okay? Um, We're still in this series, All Hail the King. But I'm going to be honest with you. I went home last week after finishing up the the passage that we walked through in John 6. We just opened up, and and we had talked through uh, the feeding of the 5,000. And if if you remember, towards the end of John 6, there's there's this, I believe it's verse 15, where it says, Jesus slips away to the mountains by himself. Remember this? Yes, remember this? And, and the reasoning was because, at least where the context we read it in, is because he believed the people were going to come and by force make him their king. And Jesus didn't want this to be the case. You say, well, I thought Jesus came to be the king. Well, he did, but not the king of their design. You see, Jesus was going and do these miracles. He was feeding. He was healing. He was providing in significant supernatural ways, and that is the reason these these people wanted to make him king. And Jesus is like, no, no, I came to be the king, but not that king. I came to be the king, but not not the kind of king you're trying to project onto me. See, people wanted him to be king because they thought, well, if if he's king, then I'll never be hungry again. If he's king, I'm not going to have to worry about money. If he's king, then I'm going to be healthy. And Jesus is like, no, no, I know and care about your needs, I know and care about your desires, but primarily the reason that I came was to be a different type of king. Amen? The reason that I came wasn't primarily just to fill your desires, but was to change your desires, to transform your desires. And so Jesus slips away. I walked away last week encouraged by that teaching, but feeling, man, I wish I had an extra hour (laughs) to talk about this. And uh, rather than just moving on into the next passage, I felt it very important, or if I wanted to sound 
important, if I wanted to sound educated, I could say pertinent. I found it very pertinent for us today to kind of just kind of pause and walk through some of the implications and reasoning behind Jesus' decision to slip away because of this image that they were trying to project on Jesus. See, they didn't want Jesus for who Jesus was. They wanted Jesus on the basis of what Jesus could do. And Jesus said, that's not why I came. That's not why I'm here. As we read through the book of Timothy, we see this passage that Paul gives us. He says, there's a time when people are not going to endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, itchy ears. Look at your neighbor and say itchy. Just say itchy. Yeah, weird word, right? But it really encapsulates what he's talking about here. And then, and then we go on in Matthew chapter 7, and we see this in verse 21. We, we talked about this last week, this demonic theology. I know that's strong terminology. We're going to get into this. It'll be hot and heavy pretty quick here. Verse 21 in Matthew 7, Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's let that sit for a minute. Let that sink in for a minute. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Or another translation would say, you workers of iniquity. Jesus starts out here by saying that the gate is wide and easy is the way that leads to destruction. It's really how he jumps into this sermon that we're still reading here. But narrow is the gate and hard is the way for those who seek life and few are those who find it. It goes on to tell us that there will be people who come into our churches and this is where I want us to be today. This is, this is very important for us today. There will be people who come into our churches and conferences and podcasts. Okay, Jesus didn't really say anything about podcasts, but you get my point. Write books, author these books and these stuff. There are going to be individuals who come in who look good, who sound good, but they are not, in fact, teachers of the gospel, and Jesus describes them as wolves in sheep's clothing. Wolves in sheep's clothing. And so when we hear the words of Jesus and read the words of Paul, is it any wonder that today the gospel that is the most popular in our pulpits, the message that is exponentially growing in recognition, in recognition is the teaching that above all else, God wants you fulfilled. God wants you healthy. God wants you in abundance. God, above all else, wants you filled and satisfied with this world. This cultural gospel, I like to call it, is nothing more. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to lean into this a little bit, okay, for a number of reasons. But what you need to understand is that this cultural gospel is what I would call a gospel of accommodation. And I call it the gospel of accommodation because it's adapting and adjusting the gospel to appease and attract people to the gospel. It's, a, it's adjusting and morphing and adapting the gospel and it, to attract people to this, quote, gospel. This different gospel is primarily, you should know, an American invention. We, we created this gospel. In fact, we, we started outsourcing it to Africa years ago, and it's prolific around the world now. And we did that to ease our lifestyle. To, it's born out of a desire for God to come alongside us in our journey of, 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 uh, of our dream, of God to come alongside us uh, in our pursuit of prosperity and wealth and being woke. And it's a gospel of accommodation. It's a non-confrontational, convenient gospel adapted to engage culture on the basis of culture and not on the basis of biblical truth. It's a different gospel. Church, listen to me now. It's a different gospel that sounds good, sounds spiritual, and sounds like something that Jesus would get behind. But I would remind you that the Apostle Paul warned. He warned us of this coming gospel which, quote, we 
have not preached. Look at this in the book of Galatians. This another light letter he's writing to the church. He says this in verse 6 of chapter 1. He says, I'm astonished. Now, I don't know if you know what that word means. It means like, I'm shocked. I'm taken aback. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a, read this next word with me, a different gospel. Let's all try that one more time. Read those two words with me. You're turning to a, a different gospel. Paul's like, don't you know any better? You're turning to a different gospel. And he goes on in verse 7. I love what he says. He says, not that there is another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. The word right there, accursed, is this Greek word anathema. And it's a pretty strong word. It's the word damned. Like, oh man, my pastor's up here cussing in church. I didn't, Paul did, so it's okay. I'm just saying, like, all right? Anathema. He says, if somebody comes to you preaching a gospel contrary to that, or even if an angel, which by the way, for our Mormon friends, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Or our Muslim friends, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Because when you start looking at the roots of religion and where theology comes from, you will oftentimes find that there's an angel who comes with a different theology, a different gospel than the one that Jesus came to give. Different sermon, different time. The fact <laughs> That's going to take a while. But the fact of the matter, he says here, is this, he says, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a contrary gospel to the one you received, let him be accursed. He said, there's coming another gospel that's going to preach another Jesus. You'll hear his name. It'll sound sweet, but it's not the Jesus that I preach, Paul said. In other words, it's not the true Jesus. Come on, church. Hello? Church? Hello? Are we seeing this? Paul tells us there's going to come a time, there's going to come a day when you're going to hear a gospel that's preached that isn't the true gospel. It's going to sound good. It's going to look good. It's going to taste good. But I'm telling you, it is not the gospel. Paul says he's astonished. He's astonished that people were so removed from, quote, him who called us into the grace of Christ to another gospel. Church, listen to me. Listen to me. There is in this land, right now, as I speak, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people attending churches uh, physically or virtually who are sitting under teaching of gospel, quote, gospel, that sounds legit, that sounds biblical, talking about a Jesus that sounds accurate, but is preaching under the guise uh, of, of truth when it is actual, actually a gospel of com accommodation. The rift is wider than it's ever been. The split is bigger than it's ever been. And Paul goes on to warn us in saying that it's not really another gospel as much as it's just a perversion of the gospel of Christ. He says they're going to change the gospel. They're going to accommodate this gospel for the lost going to accommodate for their pleasures. They're going to accommodate all of their needs and wants, and they're going to design a gospel with their own Christ and their own doctrine. Now, why is this pertinent for us today? Well, it's important for us today because as we learned about last week, these Jewish men and women who are truly seeking after a Messiah, here he is, except they didn't want the one he came to be, so they were going to invent this position for him or, 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 or put on, project onto him the Messiah they wanted him to be. Does that make sense? And so Jesus is like, no, I'm out of here. Goodbye. I'm going to a mountain. Leave me alone, right? And he disperses the crowds. You can read another parallel text in through the Gospels. Jesus disperses the crowds and he goes off alone. He doesn't even take the disciples with him. He's like, no, you guys can stay here too. Or just go across the lake. I'll catch up with you later. I'm done. I'm done. I'm clocked out for today, right? Jesus, why did he do that? Because he's frustrated, challenged maybe, at the, right? At the fact that he came to do something and people are wanting something different from him. And he says, that's not who I am. I am. And do we not see that today? Do we not see that in our churches today? Paul says in verse 8, but even if we are an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. He repeats it, anathema. 
anathema. Folks, listen to me today and hear me well. If anyone preaches a different gospel to you than the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, do not flirt with it. Do not play with it. Do not return to it. Do not stream it. Do not podcast it. Do not read it. Do not do, not do any of that. Just turn and run the other way because it is a false gospel. Man, I wish I had a church that was alive this morning to preach to on daylight savings time. It's not like the pastor's tired at all. Come on, church. If you hear another gospel, do not flirt with it. Do not play with it. It is not the actual gospel. And although it does not have the power to save you, it does have the power to deceive you. And I think all too often we know something's not accurate, but we just want to check it out. Oh, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm just going to get a little close. That's where we get hurt. God-fearing, Christ-centered Christians. That's where we get hurt. I mean, I know it's wrong, and I'm not doing it. I'm just going to get a little close. And then it starts to go through our mind, and it starts to hit us a little deep. Do you know why? Because it's a gospel of the flesh. It's a gospel that says, no, this world is about you, and Jesus exists for you, and God's universe surrounds you. You, and you're at the center of it. All of a sudden, we're like, yeah, yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, this is good. And we begin to drift away. And Jesus teaches us it's going to be difficult because, as he says, they're going to, these people, these individuals who are preaching this gospel, they're going to look good. They're going to look like sheep. But in all actuality, they are ravening wolves in sheep's clothing. It's going to look good. It's going to sound good. It's going to be coming from good people. Look how Jesus says it in verse 15 of Matthew 7. Look at this now. He says, beware. Let me, hear, let me hear you say, beware. Man, I'm telling you, for such a strong teaching, we should be a little bit louder. Let me hear you say, beware. beware. Yeah, beware of what? False prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. That, that word ravenous is this wild, just audacious, vicious, dangerous killing machine. And he says in verse 16, you're going to recognize them by their fruits. He goes on to explain, he says, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. That makes sense. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree, verse 19, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Pause. Let's, let's not just burn through that verse so quick. Jump back to verse 19. Jesus says, and, and read into these implications here, he says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Strong teaching. By the way, your small groups this week should be phenomenal because it is just power-jacked with these verses. So much deep stuff here. This being one of them, Matthew seven nineteen. Then he goes on in verse 20, he says, Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. He says the only way to determine if someone is indeed a false prophet, if it is indeed a wolf in sheep's clothing, is by looking at the fruit. And by the way, church, this is where we go wrong. Okay? And, and some of you are like, man, are we hammering on this again? Yeah, we are. We are. We're talking about this again. Because I believe that this is such an important issue for us today. Right? This, this area especially, this is where we go wrong. I'll tell you why. Scripture teaches us about the fruits of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, and so on. And Scripture teaches us, right, that these fruits will change the way we behave. You with me so far? Yes? Just give me a yes. Yes, okay. Change the way that we behave. And so we assume that when Jesus speaks in this passage about the fruit of a false prophet, he is also speaking about the actions that come from the people that are false prophets. But this is where we go wrong, Right? You don't spot a false prophet by their works. You spot a, a false prophet by their words. What makes them a wolf in sheep's clothing is that they have adapted their everyday working, their everyday life, to look exactly like every other Christian. So they will act in the same way. They'll walk in the same way. However Christians walk, I don't know. You'll walk in the same way. They'll, they'll generally have some of the same conversations. They'll do a lot of the same things. Well, he can't be bad. He tithes. 
He can't be a false preacher. They, they're over there digging wells in, in, in the Middle East. Well, they, he can't be a bad guy. Look at the size of that church. See what I'm saying, right? So this is important, and we have to get this. If their works would give them away, then they wouldn't be considered a wolf in sheep's clothing. The sheep's clothing is the fact that they indeed look and act the same way, right, that a sheep would look and act. They look and very well could be moral people, but no preaching of morality has the power to save you. The way to spot a false prophet is not in their works, it's in their words, the fruit of their words. Paul says it like this in verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to him, let him be accursed. Not works, but words. We need to examine the words of the gospel they are preaching. Now, there's a big problem with this. What's the problem? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you. Big problem. It's because we, by and large, by we, I mean Christians, uh, American churchgoers, Christian individuals, we, by and large, live in a day where our churches are largely biblically illiterate. I love you. Very much. Not as much as Christ loves you, that's for sure. But we live in a day and time where, where a lot of churches, where a lot of individuals, we are biblically illiterate. Church, listen, we don't know God's words. We know a few teachings about Jesus. We know he's got the whole world in his hands. That song, maybe, you might even know it in Spanish, and, and that's the only Spanish you can speak. You know the hand motions, you know, the whole world you know and you got that you know a hymn you know because you heard it somewhere one time at your grandma's house and then and then you even know like about Moses you know Dylan was talking about Moses today like yeah Moses I and and that's pretty much what we know I mean by and large we have very we have created a very biblically illiterate Christian culture and so if the only way to know that what someone is preaching or teaching is false is by knowing God's word you see the problem that we're in you see the predicament that you, we're in. Listen, I'm going to be honest with you. Don't take my word for anything. Don't take my word on anything I teach. Don't. You should take home what I tell you, what I read to you, and search and discover for yourself and use the discernment that the Holy Spirit has given you to discern whether what I am preaching or anybody else's preaching is truth. By the way, by the way, I know sometimes maybe we think like, well, yeah, but you're a pastor and you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You have the same Holy Spirit I have. It's not like you have Holy Spirit Junior. It's not like you have Holy Spirit Light. You know what I mean? Like, well, you really got to update your Holy Spirit. No, it's like not how. You have the same Holy Spirit. You equally have the same Word of God. You have the same access to God the Father. I don't have any special pass just because I'm a pastor. None at all. And the same burden of proof weighs on you that weighs on me. And so it is so important for us to know God's word. Jesus says in Matthew 24 that the gospel these false teachers will be teaching, listen now, will produce a great falling away. This is many people will be led astray. And so compelling will this teaching be that if possible, it would even confuse the elect. You say, who are the elect? God's chosen people. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The elect. Church, we must know. Listen to me now. Don't lose me. We must know what we believe. We must know why we believe what we believe. And we must also know where this belief comes from. We must be saturated in the word of God. We must be meditating on the words of God. We must be reading scripture, discussing scripture, arguing about scripture, fighting amongst ourselves about scripture, talking scripture with our wife, talking scripture with our children. I shudder to think that an individual could walk into our churches today Come right up front, disguised as an agent of God, and be an agent of the enemy. And we just take it. Oh, man, wasn't that good? Oh, man, that was a little bit different than normal. But, man, that made me feel great. I really like that. He's got a book. I need to get that. He's got a podcast. I'm going to follow up on that. It looks good. It sounds good. So it must be good. Paul says they're going to come in, glory, in their own glory. 
in their own flesh. They're going to glory in their might. They're going to glory in their money, in their bigness of numbers. They're going to glory in the fact that they are so contemporary, so relevant. Man, look, at he, he's on fire. Look at his vocal inflections and dynamics when he teaches. What? Look at how many people are showing up. God must be doing something. Hopefully. I love, I love Francis Chan. I don't know if you know who that is or not. Francis Chan. Uh, he, wrote a, he wrote a book. He's wrote, written a couple of them. One is called Crazy Love. And, and he, says, he says, I'm paraphrasing. He says something similar to this. He says, if you give me enough time, money, and people, I can fabricate a move of God. And I want you to think about that. I, I hear God is moving touted everywhere. Look at God's movement in our church. Look at God's movement in our church. And I see less discipleship than ever. I see, man, God's moving in big ways. God's doing good things. I'm seeing less people meet Jesus than ever. I'm seeing less people get baptized than ever. I'm seeing more divorces than ever. I'm seeing more abuse than ever. I'm seeing more brokenness in the church than ever. So you tell me, is God moving truly, changing our desires and our hopes, forcing us or, or forging us into the image of Christ, which is, which is sanctification, or do we just have more money, resources, time, and people than we've ever had before to create something which looks an awful lot like the gospel but may not actually be the gospel? And listen, Jesus says what he said about false prophets in the context of his sermon where he tells us that narrow is the way that leads to life and few, that, few are those who find it. Uh, I'm sorry, narrow is the way that leads to life and few are those who find it, but wide is the gate that leads to destruction. He uses those two teachings in the same sermon. False prophets, false teachers, false preachers, false evangelists, they're going to come saying, you know what? You know what? And they're going to do like this. They're going to come and they're going to sit down. They're going to get really real. You know what I've learned? Let me just tell you about my experience. The way really is not that narrow. The way to Jesus, it, it really, I think that we make it a lot harder than it needs to be. You know what I found? And I was just talking to somebody the other day about this. It's really not that difficult to, to follow Jesus. In fact, the greatest day of my life was when I met Jesus. You know why? Because that's when everything changed for the better. We begin hearing this, and we begin thinking, man, this must be real. Man, this, this must be literal. This must be true. And what I want you to understand is that it could be that it's just a gospel of accommodation. I have to finish this today. But let, let me just say, today, many avenues, we have dumbed down the gospel of Christ. We've dumbed it down. And we've dumbed it down because we're trying to use carnal means to, to reach carnal men and women. And it's worked. And so what we do is use greater carnal means to reach more men and women. And it works. And so we end up building a church on the foundation of entertainment instead of the, the foundation of Jesus Christ. And so what you do is you just keep entertaining. You keep entertaining. And you know, you know what that costs you? A lot of money. It costs you a lot of excellence. We need effort. We need time. We need, we need money. Why? Because we're building an entertainment machine. We're building Hollywood in our church. And I ask you, why are you doing that? It's the only way to reach people, apparently. And here comes Jesus, the most non-entertaining individual in history who just walks up and says, hey, these people look hungry. What are we going to do? Well, there's a boy over here, Jesus. He's got a couple of loaves and some fish. Okay, we'll bring him over here. Hey, everybody, real quick, just come around. Let me bless this food. Jesus, there's enough for everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm God, remember? Okay, yeah. Makes right. We want to make you king. No, 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 no. Not, not the king I came to be. You, you want the king that you want. That's not why I came. Well, Jesus, we want you front and center. We want to we bolster you up. We want to put you. No, no, no. I'm not, that's not what I'm here to do. That's, that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to, to get you to the Father. I'm here to introduce you to the Father. I'm here to, to create a path to which was broken. And it's so sad to me, church. It's so heartbreaking because... It, it, this isn't just like a large church issue. It's not even a small, it's just a church issue. And so I don't care if your church is, is gigantic. I have friends who pastor churches of 
20, 30, 40,000 people. I have other pastors who pastor churches who are in houses, and there's, there's five, six, seven people. They're, they're both church. You understand that? This is a church issue on either side. Okay? It's a problem because it's so heartbreaking because there are truly genuine Christian men and women inside of, of churches who, who just want God's word spoken, who just want authentic worship. And so because we create churches of accommodation around people we're trying to entertain, and money goes towards that, the people who are genuinely following after Jesus are being starved. Not building up. When you hear a pastor tell you, listen, if you know Jesus, this church is not for you. Run away from that church. If I ever say that, punch me in the face and run away. Don't punch me. Just run away from this church. You can't divide a Christian from the church because they are the church. They are the body. And I think that's why I have such beef with this. I think that's why I take it personally. And I think you should get a little upset about it. I liken it to this. If if my wife was out shopping for groceries and she's bringing her groceries out to the car and, and a group of guys come up and attack her and you see this happening, Yes, I'm going to follow up with authorities and, and go after the people that attacked my wife, but, but I'm also going to come and knock on your door. I'm going to say, you saw this happen to my wife and you didn't do anything? You call me a brother and you didn't help? Yeah, I know it was tough. Yeah, I know how to put yourself out there, but you didn't do anything to save my wife? Church, do you know that our church, the church, is, is considered the bride of Jesus Christ? When, when do we stand up? When do we get strong? When do we dig deep? When do we put on the armor of God and say, no, we're not going to do this anymore. I know it's going to ruffle some feathers, but there is some absolute foundational truth that I cannot change, that I'm going to stand on, that I'm going to teach my children, that I'm going to live through in my life. At what point do we begin doing that, Christians? At what point do we begin changing our lifestyle because of the gospel? Not changing the gospel because of our lifestyle. At what point do we do that? I would say we need to do that now. Maybe yesterday. It's pertinent. It's important. It's prevalent. It's timely. And it's costly. Just bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. I want to encourage you right now just to spend a moment in prayer. I'm going to ask you some, just some key elements here as you pray. Ask God to open up the eyes of your heart. Ask God to, to open up your ears, to give you open hands and open mind to, to what the Spirit is teaching you and leading you in this book, in His words, and God's unadulterated, perfect book of Scripture. What is God bringing to your heart and your mind today? Maybe for us, maybe it's one of conviction. Maybe it's sin. And maybe it's sin of commission. Maybe it's sin of omission. Maybe, maybe you didn't realize it, but you've just been going along. Listen, repent of your sin. Buy into the gospel that comes from Scripture, not the gospel that comes from culture, no matter how beautifully or sexy it's packaged. I get it. This gospel is rough. I get it, this gospel is gritty, it is tough. It requires you to pick up your cross and follow after Jesus. It's a call to die, but it is the gospel that we have been given and we are to obey it, church. Obey it, not compromise, obey it, not change it, obey it, not sacrifice it on the culture, sacrifice it on the altar of culture. Father, would you continue to work and move in our hearts and lives, change our church, shape our church. May we be less concerned about being woke, and may we truly wake up to the gospel of Jesus. We serve a real Jesus who is who he is. 
And that's a gospel that truly is offensive, where a man is a sinner in need of a Savior. It's filled with grace, but it's also filled with that truth. And in my heart, my flesh does not like that because it forces me to change and shift. Thankfully, your spirit indwells us as God, and you begin to change. As Ezekiel says, you take out our heart of flesh and put in a a new heart, a heart of stone, receptive to you, receptive, Lord, takes out our heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh, receptive to you, moving us today, in Jesus' name, amen. Eyes closed, heads bowed, we're going to take the next 20 seconds, this music's going to roll, we're going to be quiet and silent before, before our King, before our God, before Jesus. I want us to leave this place today with this just seared into our mind. We can no longer sit on the sidelines and allow a cultural gospel that is truly no gospel at all to continue dominating our pulpits and churches and homes today. What are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about that? Next couple moments, just in silence before we, before we release.